What is up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Limited Resources. This is episode number 272. My name is Marshall. I'm one of your limited resources, and joining me on the line, as with every week, it's Luis Scott Vargas. Luis, what's up, buddy? Uh, not a whole lot. I'm just... Uh... Checking on my Kickstarter game that's been uh, going pretty well. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Jose, you, you fool. You fool so much. Uh, so we've got a really great show for you guys lined up this week. Uh, we've got a very special guest who I'll introduce in just a moment. Uh, but before I do, let's take a minute to talk about ChannelFireball.com. They are the sponsors of Limited Resources. And uh, not only are they a great website to visit for a bunch of high-quality free content, but also to pick up all of your magic needs, they also host magic tournaments. They, they're tournament organizers as well, which I think is great, primarily in the west western part of the United States, but occasionally <laughs> they will uh, make the long trip over, in this case, to Liverpool, Luis. It's a, it's, there's going to be a GP in Liverpool uh, on March 6th through 8th. Yeah, and uh, I will actually be in attendance along with Josh Utterlayton, Frank Carson, Martin Juza. So we've got an, and uh, is even Travis Wood. So we've got three three people coming from the West Coast to to play in the tournament, as well as of course, you know, a lot of staff and uh, people going over to run the tournament. So we're we're really excited. It's our first you know foreign tournament, and it's one that promises to be pretty big. Uh, one note is that we expect it to to cap. We have a cap of eight hundred eighteen hundred and fifty people. And uh, we've got over a thousand pre-reg right now, so I would would encourage anyone interested in attending to go to gpliverpool.com and and sign up for the tournament. You get a bunch of free stuff for signing up, and uh, it's going to be an awesome tournament. So you certainly don't want to miss it. Yeah, that sounds great. I uh, I wish I had the uh, the chance to go to it. It's a little too far for me to make the trek, but uh, that should be a cool one, and uh, I'm looking forward to see how it goes. Uh, if you would like to support Limited Resources directly, you can do so at Patreon. We have a link for it on lrcast.com, and I encourage you to check that out. You can get some some cool bonuses and such too. All right, why don't we dive into our uh, our main topic and our and our main show here? Uh, we've got a guest, and it is a, a long time coming. He actually was. I believe our first guest, I think he was actually the first guest we ever had on this show. And, uh, and we're, we're bringing him back here. Actually, going back to the Kickstarter, uh, this was, we've got, Luis has been on a bunch, so I, I figure that box has been checked. But we've got Patrick, we've also got Sam Black and David Williams lined up. And uh, for now, though, we get Patrick Chapin. And uh, Patrick, I want to welcome you to the show. You, of course, are a Pro Tour champion, a Hall of Famer, the author of Next Level Magic, and co-host of the Top Level podcast as well. Patrick, welcome. Hey, it's great to be here. How yeah, you doing? You remember when you came on the show way back in the day? Yeah, yeah, I like to try to hop on at least once every 272 episodes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that was great. I remember that uh, when, when we had you come on. That was a long time ago. That was back in the Ryan Spain days, in fact. And uh, <laughs> I've had two different co-hosts in between and now another one after that, some, some random guy that is on the line with us now. You, I think Ho- you, you talking about Jose? Yeah, Jose. You work with him, right? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so what we're going to do here, uh, Patrick, is um, uh, we're going to do a crack a pack as is tradition on limited resources. And I thought it would be kind of fun to get uh, your perspective. You know, you you did a lot of testing for the Pro Tour as well, though it was on a separate team from Luis. And, and uh, of course, so we get a chance to, to kind of get your perspective on Fate Reforged as you see it. Uh, and then I've got questions for you. Uh, I, the way I like to view these these pro shows is to bring you on and kind of have a conversation with you, but I let the questions be the guide for the conversation. And uh, they're listener questions. They're questions that I put out uh, on the Patreon and on the uh, LRCast subreddit. And we got a lot of questions for you. I've got, I picked out a bunch of them and we're going to see how many we can get through and just kind of use it as a guide for our conversation. But like I said, before we do that, I've got a crack a pack. And this one was given to me at GP San Jose from Logan's mom. She also gave me uh, a really uh, – she, she gave me a hand-typed letter. Like she wrote a letter, uh, you know, talking about her experience with the show and with her son and stuff. And it was really touching. It was super awesome. She was really nice. And uh, I wanted to say thank you for both the letter and for the pack. So why don't we dive in here? Uh, <laughs> a fitting opening card for you, Patrick. I know, I know what this is. <laughs> <laughs> it's Gurmog Angler. <laughs> it's, uh, it's your boy. <laughs> uh huh. <laughs> so we'll, we'll talk about that one in a few minutes, uh, but in, in a bigger context, maybe. But what do you think about that card for limited? Uh it's it's totally reasonable, but it's it's not one of the uh, 
it's it's not a card I, w- I first pick all that often, but it's it's totally reasonable. It's better in the the sort of bigger mana soul tie decks that sometimes turn into uh, to four or five color control, and um, it's also a totally fine card for like a black white uh, mid range, like a, a slow like it's a fine option for like a black white, uh, which is a color combination I very very strongly look to. Okay, but, what, what do you think about it for modern? <laughs> I think it is absolutely fantastic. <laughs> As you showed, for those that know, we're teasing Patrick because he actually played Gurmog Angler in Modern at the Pro Tour. Um, next card is Refocus. One and a blue, instant untapped target creature, draw a card. What do you a, think about that one? Yeah, uh, definitely a little more fringe. Um, I end up playing them sometimes in sort of a uh, like a blue-white or blue-red or just guy, sort of a very... Um, you know, uh, tempo based and just, uh, trying to take advantage of prowess, but it, I often end up cutting it. Yeah. That, that's, that's been my experience with it as well. This next one is soul summons. Luis, uh, we had a little chat about this when we were at the PT. You feel like this one's gone down a bit for you. Yeah. I have not been very happy with random two drops in this format. And despite the fact that this could manifest something, it, it pretty much falls into the category of random two drop for me. I, I need a reason to play it. It's not a card. I'm like, yep, this is a great card. I'm going to put it in my deck. Yeah, I was a little slower to adjust to that. But when you put it in that context, I have to agree. Uh, you know, I don't prioritize uh, two drops generally. But for some reason, I kept taking soul summons, you know, fourth, fifth, like relatively high in the pack and feeling pretty good about it. Because in my mind, this is one of those cards that I tend to gravitate towards because it has such a low uh, such a high downside, like it's, it's floor is quite high. It's a, you know, a bear or whatever. It's like never going to be awful. And then it has this random upside of sometimes manifesting into something bigger. And for me, that's a, that's a great spot for two mana. But when I compare it to how I prioritize other two drops, uh, you know, for some reason I had it a bit higher and I don't think it actually deserves to be. If I want a two drop, then this one's perfectly fine. But my general consensus is that I kind of don't want that many two drops. So I, I had to lower it down after that chat with you, uh, because yeah, I agreed. It was just, uh, not really what I wanted to be doing. I mean, I'll still play it. It's not a bad card, but, uh, I just don't prioritize it anymore. Yeah. Even though it's, it's accurate to say that the, the, you know, the, the bottom end of this is still reasonable because it's a two drop, like a two drop two, two. It turns out that's actually pretty close to the top end too. <laughs> it is, yeah. It, it it does not often overperform from there, and that that means that yes, it's it's never going to be horrible. But I've found it to be really great either. So it's not a card I, I really prioritize. Uh, this is a card that I know you like a lot, uh, Luis. Uh, it's Will of the Naga. You said you'd be you'd be happy playing one of these in basically any deck that could cast it, and then if your deck was heavily tempo oriented you'd you'd go up to another copy of it um patrick i'm i'm curious where are you at on will of the naga so will the naga was one of the most controversial cards in uh in our in our testing house at the uh the cfb pantheon house it was something that some people thought oh i just want several i'm going to play it every time and there were some people who often did not want to play it and it kind of came down to what kind of decks people were playing the people like when people were playing controlling decks will of the naga was looking just you know, very so-so, whereas the card is absolutely fantastic the more aggressive and more tempo-based you are. And I think the general consensus was that uh, the card is fine to put one in uh, in some decks and great to play whatever you can get, you know, to get as many as you can get if you're playing a more aggressive deck. And Luis- I personally probably overdrafted it, but I, it was, okay. I love it. What, what about you, Luis? I, did I characterize your, uh, your stance on it okay? Absolutely not. Okay. Correct me. Uh, actually, it's pretty close to what you said. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and it, it's funny that you mentioned, you know, a- asking Patrick what he thought about it. Uh, I was curious about the same thing because after my latest draft video on Channel Fireball, Owen messaged me and was like, man, I think you like Waldenaga way too much. I, you know, I, I wouldn't have taken it, taken it where you did in the draft. And uh, I don't know if I even like it in your deck. So he 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 thought the card was a lot worse, and I, I'm curious if Patrick, if Owen is one of the people in the camp of yes, I don't really want Will the Naga in my deck. <laughs> yes, yeah, he was. And what, what, out of curiosity, was the deck he drafted more control, like a slower and more controlling deck, or was it actually a very aggressive deck? It, it wasn't a controlling deck, but it was more mid range. I think a little bit more aggressive than mid range, but still, you could call it mid range. But part of Owen's point was that he would have taken Cunning Strike, a card he likes a lot. 
over Will the Naga, and that's not. I would tend to take Will the Naga there. I, I I found more decks where I wanted that card, and I and I thought it was more integral to those decks. Even though Cunning Strike's a fine card, it was never uh, like a key piece of any of my decks. Whereas the aggressive decks love to have a Will the Naga. So that that may be just how I I end up drafting Jeskai. I actually even drafted a lot more tempo based than you would expect given my uh, proclivities, but. I, I like Teamer Battle Rages, Will the Nagas, and Whirlwind Adepts. What can I say? <laughs> <laughs> Whirlwind Adepts actually one of the biggest gainers. You know, we kind of just... Oh, yeah. I think that card's great now. Absolutely. Like, we were shocked. Like, that's a card that went from, like, usually sitting on, in the sideboard to... Every, we just always play it in all of our decks. Yeah, that was a big changer. Uh, our next card here is uh, Ancestral Vengeance, one that hasn't really performed super well. I don't think it's... Uh, it's the Black Black Enchant Creature... You get to put a plus one, plus one counter on one of your guys, and the enchanted creature gets minus one, minus one. <laughs> Speaking of uh, the Pantheon drafting, I actually watched, and this is, Owen and I were watching Reed Duke do a, do a draft, and Reed drafted a deck with Ancestral Vengeance and uh, Lotus Eye Mystics, the 3 2 that draws an enchantment out of your graveyard. Mm. <laughs> and the whole time, Owen is just mocking Reed for drafting such a bad deck. <laughs> <laughs> this does not seem like an amazing combo. <laughs> There's just not a ton of support for, for sort of these enchantment themes. Like they're just like they're just end up not being a ton of cards to make you know the idea of recur you know recur uh, using recursion with your enchantments and uh, ancestral vengeance just doesn't end up performing super well considering how slightly you know how awkward it is to try to use yeah and plus the black black is pretty rough uh, oftentimes you'll want to cast that very early in the game and won't be able to if you're a three color deck it just has a lot going against it. Um, Lightning Shrieker is next. This is the four and a red five five flying trample haste dragon that gets shuffled back in. Um, it's kind of like a combo. <laughs> yeah, I, you know it's funny. I you know when I first saw this card, I thought it was terrible, and then somebody played it against me, and I thought, well, that card's pretty terrible. And then I tried it once, and I thought this card's terrible, and I, I haven't really moved. Like I just don't think this card's good. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just I'm just kind of off of Lightning Shrieker. Yeah, my opinion has not wavered on that one. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we tried. We try. I mean, people would, you know, like you should have seen Owen trying to tough it out with his uh, <laughs> mono red deck at one point, and eventually it was just like, Owen, do you think maybe it would be better if you just put two more land in your deck? Like <laughs> so you can still, like once you're mono red, fine. But yeah, Lightning Shrieker has mostly looked like a, kind of a bad lava axe. Yeah, which is not to say <laughs> totally unplayable, but I mean, it's a worse lava axe when you want lava axe, and a lot of decks don't even want lava axe. Yeah, Correct. exactly. Uh, next is Archers of Carsey. That's the 5-2 Defender Reach for four. Uh, I, I haven't really found much of a spot for this either. Um, you know, I thought maybe out of the board I'd occasionally bring it in, but generally speaking, there's actually a fair bit of Reach in this format that's more playable than Archers of Carsey, so I, I actually haven't even found a spot to bring it in yet. Yeah, I've yet to have this deck touch or this yeah. card touch my deck. Yeah, I, just, I, I, I usually just board it against the five five shrieker that you were just talking <laughs> so about. that you only take three. Yeah. <laughs> well, you, uh, you need to board in your reach to stop their reach. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's good. They cancel out. That's that's good uh, theory. Um, we need to write an article about that for CFB. <laughs> yeah. um, next is uh, Randy Bueller's favorite card, Smoldering Afrit. It's uh, uh, one in a red for a two two, and when it dies, it does two damage to you. Um, you know, I, I don't know. I, I, I've kind of looked at this card the whole time as a card that you could play if you were trying to play a super aggressive, uh, you know, two drop red type strategy. But it's not good, right? I mean, it's it's like think about what we were talking about with the two drops before. You know, you don't prioritize them generally. There is a deck out there that wants them and would probably play this, but I don't think I'd ever consider first picking a smaller in a freight. Yeah, that is a. Uh, it's not a card I would uh, be unhappy to run in a, in the red aggressive decks because the drawback is yeah, fairly ne- negligible and you do want twos. But yeah, if you have to first pick this card, that the, I can't even imagine the pack that it would look like. I mean, unless you're Randy. Uh, the next <laughs> one is Return to the Earth, which uh, we covered this last week as well. It's the three and a green instant destroy target artifact uh, enchantment or creature with flying, and uh, I have also yet to find the occasion to bring this thing in. I. It's just one of those – it just feels like kind of a trap card where – I mean I could certainly construct a scenario where I would bring it in. But even if my opponent played like a Siege, uh, I don't know that I would bring in Return to the Earth. Like I, it, it just feels like one of those cards that y- is still too narrow for that si- situation. I mean if I saw you know, two dragons and a Siege and you know an equipment or something, okay, fine. It's coming in. I'll, I'll bite the bullet. But 
beyond that, this card's just super clunky. Yep. So we we actually that's a card that moved up a little bit in our estimation. Oh. At first nobody played it and it was just a sideboard card occasionally, you know, because of being, you know, somebody might have a lot of flyers and a siege or whatever or a uh or the cloud, you know, a mist form or I mean cloud form or light form or whatever. Mm-hmm. But uh I guess life form doesn't matter too much, but but uh, one of the things that that people kind of found was that it wasn't actually the most embarrassing card to main deck. Now I still think that that nobody is really main decking it more than like fifteen percent of the time, but it was fifteen maybe. T- but you know, usually only when things have kind of not panned out exactly the way you wanted. But uh, it was not as stone on main deckable as we originally thought. Interesting. Uh, that's interesting. Uh, the next one is a uh, great horn crew shock. That's the three, five for five. Um, you know, I, I actually don't mind a three, five for five in the right spot. I mean, I'm not as enamored with them as Shuhei, but I'll play one here and there, but I haven't actually found a spot for great horn crew shock yet. It just doesn't seem well positioned in this uh, format. No, the, the stats are just not there. Uh, you, you can get a better deal on countless other cards. What about the flavor text? Is that is it no? <laughs> the, the flavor text salvages a little bit. All right. But. <laughs> I was gonna say if the stats aren't there, there's only one other place to look. Um, all right, it's time for our uncommons, which is, you know, as you'll see, I mean, in most sets, the commons are slightly worse or worse than the uncommons, and then and then goes up to the rares. But there seems to be like significant steps uh, in Fate Reforged where you'll often not you'll often look at the uncommons and think, okay, well, there's one here that's just way better than the. Uh, than the rest of the commons, and then maybe I'll even hit a rare that's better than that. So let's see if that happens here. The first uncommon is uh, Erishan War Beast, which is the uh, seven mana, five green, green, six, six. And uh, whenever it deals combat damage to one or more blocking creatures, you manifest the top card of your library. Uh, I mean, this is kind of in the Great Horde and Crushock camp of large vanilla that you're not getting a great deal on and th- those just don't do well in this format because you can get large vanilla morphs that you just have such efficient ways to cast them yeah did you patrick did you ever have you ever played an erishan war beast i've never actually no. played with or against one yet yeah we it just there's there's no shortage of uh now i've seen it in play it wasn't against me but i've seen it on the table but it you know it often involved uh people that weren't necessarily pleased with the direction their their draft had gone. <laughs> right. <laughs> and uh, in general, there's no there's no shortage of expensive uh, cards available if you just want to play with something that's big and powerful. And yeah. this is a format where, like, I mean, for instance, a lot of the dragons people wind up just not playing. So, like, to have a six six dummy who isn't even flying or doing much of anything is is not for seven is not super appealing. Yeah, card just doesn't seem good. Um, next is Dragon Rage. Mm-hmm. which is a card that I also haven't actually played with or gotten killed by yet. Uh, it's two and a red for an instant, and it says add red mana to your mana pool for each attacking creature you control, and in a tell end of turn, all your creatures get fire breathing, so you can pay red to pump them plus one, plus oh, until end of turn. Um, you know, I, I think that during the set review, Luis, you and I talked about this and kind of said, well, let's compare this to trumpet blast. And we kind of figured that trumpet blast was better than this. Um, I haven't really gone back to it since, uh, when I see it in the pack, I don't even consider it. And like I said, I haven't even gotten got by it yet where I'm like, Oh, that's what that does. It just isn't really on my radar. Is, is that where it belongs just off of our radar? Yeah. Like you said, uh, I've never been defeated by this card, but it has been cast against me. So, okay. <laughs> so yeah, we, we, I saw, uh, I know of at least twice in which it was played in our house by people who were specifically putting it in their deck because we had drafted so many times and nobody had ever cast it, and they both sort of just added to their deck because they're like, "Oh, I just wanted to try it out," and they both reported that it was uh, a fair bit worse than Trumpet Blast. Okay. Yeah, and and an uncommon you have to spend a, a you don't see them as often either. Now this next one is an interesting one. It's our last uncommon, and it's uh, it's Bloodfire Enforcers. Um, this is the the combo, right? It's it's the three and a red for a five two, and it gets first strike and trample if you have an instant and sorcery card in your graveyard. Um, is this one just too high in the sky? Is it just a dream to try to actually? Because I mean, a five-two first strike trample is insane, right? For four mana, but it's just so difficult to get it to that point. 
Patrick, I'm curious what, you, what your experiences yeah, are with this. Yeah, I actually, I've actually had uh, reasonable experiences with this guy. Now, I generally try to avoid picking <laughs> red cards anyway. Mm-hmm. So uh, I'm, I'm generally, I mean, there's, it, it's a strange pack where I first pick a red card that isn't like, you know, wild slash or better. Mm-hmm. But, um, but I, uh, if I'm playing red, uh, you know, once I'm in a space where I'm, if I have this guy, I do make draft decisions based on it. I mean, you always get him in the first pack if you're, if you're going to get him at all. And even if you don't get there all that often, a five two for four is not the end of the world, and the fact that you can you can trigger him in the middle of combat uh, as an instant, I mean, it's the guy is the guy actually overperformed, and uh, I I don't I don't hate this guy. What do you think about him, Luis? Yeah, I, I I like this card a lot more than I thought I would. I, at first, I was like, yeah, you know, this card isn't going to be much more than a five two most of the time, but turns out naturally a lot of the decks where I where I want them, which are the red blue decks. You you exactly. have a mix of of you know two to four of e- in each category because those are spell heavy decks anyway because you're you're playing all these just guide prowess cards, mm. which means that often it's just going to be a five two first strike trample which is great and sometimes like Patrick said you attack with it as a five two trample and your opponent's like uh, or a five two rather and your opponent's like uh, I guess I'll block my three three and then you you know you cast refocus or some other garbagey instant and all of a sudden you just blew wow. your opponent out yeah that's true and you know I was thinking uh, cards like uh, right into bean. You know, really work well with this too, right? Yeah, because it's a sorcery that you want in your deck that also counts as a creature and it's right. just a good card already. So you don't have to pay many deck building costs to play this is, is the main thing is that it's not like I'm adding a bunch of cards that I wouldn't otherwise play to make it. Maybe I, I will add like the, the odd refocus in there. But, you know, I'm going to play Will of the Naga and what other good tricks I get. And I'm going to play all the right into beings I get. So it's not – I'm not bending over backwards to, to enable this card – and a 5-2 with no abilities is good with cards like Will of the Naga. So it, it all works ha- out. Somebody in our house, I think it was Andrew Cuneo, uh, sacked a manifest to his collateral damage. And the manifest <laughs> was the sorcery. And it was like, really? Oh, yeah, really? No. <laughs> that sounds absurd. The, what? A, like, really? So it was. that was pretty sick. That's pretty great. Um, all right. So before our rare, well, actually, you know what? I will just say our rare right now. We've got a land, of course, as well. Um, the rare is Flame Rush Rider. So this is the the three three for five, but it's got dash for two red red, and whenever it attacks, you get to put a token onto the battlefield tapped and attacking. That's a copy of another target attacking creature, and then that token gets exiled after combat. Um, explosive card. I mean, it's capable of of delivering huge punches uh, of damage that your opponent might not have seen coming um definitely a, a threatening like you even if you play it on five mana as a three three it doesn't look that scary but then when they look at whatever your other you know good creature that can attack is it, it certainly changes the way that your opponent has to approach the game uh how high are you on flame rush rider patrick if i'm red i mean this card is great and it sounds like it's the best card in the pack you know if you don't care about color Mm-hmm. Um, I'm a, I'm a fan of this guy. It's not a bomb, like a windmill slam type of bomb, but, uh, I think this card is great. If you're, you know, if you're doing that, this card is a, this card is often a, an excellent, excellent card in bad decks. Where are you at on it, Luis? Uh, it's, it's, it's a solid card. It, it is an excellent card in bad decks and it's also a pretty powerful card by itself. I, I don't think that, uh, I would ever not play this if I was a, you know, a heavy red deck Partially because heavy red decks tend to be aggressive anyway, and this is a very, very good aggressive card. I mean, sometimes this is seven plus damage with haste, which you know is is not is no small thing. The right. place I really like this guy is in blue red. Outside of how aggressive blue red can be, uh, you know, I I like just copying the uh, the the, the two two flyer that bounces something. You yeah, know, even surveyor that's not bad at all. Yeah, there's some pretty cool combos you can do with flame rush rider once you're once you get that going too. Yeah, card's really good. Um, our last card if, is, of course, a land. It's Blossoming Sands in this case. Um, but I did want to use Blossoming Sands or whatever land we got here uh, to ask you, Patrick, about drafting five colors slash all the lands you can out of the uh, out of the first pack. We had a chance at the Pro Tour to chat with Yelger, who is pretty high on that strategy. It didn't end up happening for him in his second draft because the cards just didn't dictate it but he did it in his first draft and and i was wondering if if you know how high were you guys on that coming out of the testing 
Uh, pretty high. The only thing that kind of made it a little strange was that so many people were high on it that a lot of people just didn't get a chance to test it very much because uh, you mean within the testing group? Yeah. Within our testing group, uh, it very early on looked awesome, but then we got into this weird spot where there were several people who forced it every single time. Mm. And because they would force it to the death every time it made it so that a number of people, you know, like, I mean, some, okay, sometimes people just train wreck trying to do it. And, but there were a number of people who didn't get a chance to do it very often. However, it generally looked pretty good. Um, and some of the theory behind it was pretty good. And I think most of the people on our squad were, were looking to see if it made sense. Yeah. That's one of the dangers that we've found with uh, the, the like team drafts is that a couple drafts in, you have maybe too many people forcing a strategy that the team as a whole thinks is good, but when you're at the pro tour, your table's not going to necessarily think is good. So it, it can even it can look worse than it would normally be. Like your example, if you have four people at the table forcing, then you're going to think, well, maybe this isn't as good as it, as it would be, but it actually is good. And you also know people's predilections, where you know if you're sitting and Zv, you know he's one of the people who seems like he gets on things and just completely forces them. If he's to your right and you know he's going to force five color. It makes you less likely to draft five color, even if maybe you're, you should have. Yeah. yeah. Huh. That's the really interesting part about it, too, is that when it was triple cons and five color got popular, um, you know, you could start to kind of figure out when other people were doing it. But in Fate Reforged, like, there's guaranteed one dual land. If, if you get three packs in a row in the, you know, in the early middle part of the pack and they don't have that land in it, like somebody's taking those, right? It's not like they just disappear normally. There's enough cards, you know, to take in the early part of the pack that you would take over a land in most cases anyway. And, uh, so I, it, it's funny just because the signals can become quite clear, uh, whether if somebody's really going after the lands or not. So Tom Ross was the person in our house who forced it the hardest where he was just to the death, he's going to do it, whatever. He, he ended up, uh, in his pick order, scou- like Scoured Barons was, uh, he would pick Scoured Barons over almost every single common. Wow. <laughs> I know. It was like, dude, whoa, whoa. Now, part of the reason I think that, uh, that I think this, you know, picking the, the lands here is, is so attractive is that uh, a lot, we found that a lot of people were gravitating towards two-color decks or primarily two-color decks, and they didn't want to lock in a third color until, uh, until cons. And as a result, the, some of the dual lands in uh, the first pack were going later than they normally would. And so somebody can just see that, you know, can, can just scoop up a whole bunch of them. And the opportunity cost is a little bit lower because... Uh, a lot of the commons in in this set uh, are replaceable, and the uh, the the upside for the the best of them isn't dramatically higher than a lot of the filler commons. Whereas in cons of Tarkir, there is a huge power spike with some of the gold cards, particularly the three color cards, where some of the three color cards are just two tiers better than anything else in the pack, but they go around much later than they used to because the number of people drafting three colors is actually lower. And, um, and so that was one of the reasons to be open to the possibility of playing five color or four color more commonly was the, uh, the possibility of scooping up some late pick three color cards and just having a lot more power. Yeah. I saw that quite a bit. Um, so what do you guys like from this pack? Is it just flame rush rider? No, no question. Yeah, it, it not, and that's more a reflection on the pack than Flame Rush Rider's power. I mean, I'm not unhappy to take Flame Rush Rider early, but it's not a card I'm like super happy to take early either. And this pack just doesn't have anything that can compete with it. Yeah, that's kind of what I'm seeing uh, here too. What do you like, Patrick? Well, so it's tough. I'd have to. I mean, this is one of those. I would like to believe that I would pick Flame Rush Rider and just <laughs> suck it up. But you're slamming but the land. I, I know. It. I, I, so I'm. I'm looking the. So the the t- so the thing is I'm lo- my three choices besides Flame Rush Rider, because I mean, one argument against Flame Rush Rider is that this pack is pretty weak, and I kind of think the second strongest card is Red too, um, mm-hmm. I, which is not necessarily going to get anybody in or anything. But I uh, the I think the Green White Land is an option. I think that Soul Summons is very mediocre, 
but at least the color is right. I think that Gurmag Angler is okay, but at least it's it fits into decks that I want to be in. And at least uh, the 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 green white land, you know that that fits into a strategy that I would rather be playing than a Flame Rush Rider deck. I think that if I knew nothing about the other people at my table, I I might pick. Uh, I mean, I might pick. And I know this is funny, but Gurmeg Angler. I don't know. I. I love black white and I, I kind of, I will play, I'll take any excuse to be black white warriors. And I kind of just generally sit down imagining I'm going to be a black, I personally, I'm going to be a black white warriors deck unless somebody stops me. And oh, so, wow. So you're actually looking to push that through. Right. Absolutely. I'm, I'm the nice thing about passing flame rush rider is that, uh, the person on my left is probably going to pick it. And, you know, that gives me a little bit of, you know, hopefully I can kind of steer things a little bit that way. But uh, I, I, I think the blue red could be awesome. You know, I think that if I if I actually have more confidence in my own ability to draft blue red, that the better pick for is probably the flame rush rider. But I just know that my personal win percentage, I mean, like I. My personal win percentage was just much higher when I was drafting. When I, whenever I started looking at white, black, and was willing to, to go other things like white, blue, or, or switch into Obzon or whatever, or Mardu, uh, I had a lot more success than when I tried to actually draft real red decks. And uh, I, 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 I think a better drafter than me would, prob- should, would probably be better served with the Flame Rush Rider. But, well, that's interesting. Uh, no, that's really I, interesting. I mean, I think that like color preference certainly should come into the decision. I I know for me, like I'm not a huge fan of red either, but I think that Flame Rush Rider is definitely better enough than any of the other cards that I would still take it. But I can see what you're saying. Like you're trying to set yourself up thinking longer term and for you, that gap isn't as big. So, you know, that makes sense. Yeah. I mean, I, the other thing is that it's very possible that, that Flame Crush Rider or Flame Rush Rider is actually still the pick for me and that I just play it as a, like, I look to see if blue red is open. I possibly just abandon the flame rush rider and switch into, you know, go back to black white, because honestly, if I lose a Gurmag angler or a soul summons, I've lost very, very little. And for a black white warriors deck, but I mean, how does it change things? If, uh, the draft is rounds one through three and modern is round four and you don't have a Gurmag angler yet for your, for your modern. (laughs) (laughs) Honestly, I dude, I might pick an Avon Skirmisher <laughs> over the Flame Rush Rider. Jeez, well, it, see that that's interesting because that makes a lot more sense. When you're first like, I would maybe take Soul Summons or Gurmag Angler. I was like, wow, you really don't like Red and don't like Flame Rush Rider. Turns out you really just like Black White Warriors. And if you're willing to take you know Skirmishers and Gurmag Anglers over Red cards that are just better, I mean that makes sense. I've I have been in formats where I would do something like that. And if, if you feel that strongly about Black White Warriors and have the most experience drafting it, it does make sense to you know that perspective is a logical one. It's not may, maybe if you had infinite time to 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 do drafts, you, it would change. But you know if that's where you are when the Pro Tour rolls around, like you don't. It's not like you have you know three months to figure out your draft strategy. I just like yeah. that pick because it's funny. I mean, I, I, <laughs> I'm picking I'm picking pressure point. Over wild slash, like I'm. Oh yeah, you're crazy. (laughs) You're you're officially that. That that, that I'm less. So uh, here's the thing about wild slash. See, wild slash is the funny one because wild slash, you really you you don't want to splash your wild slash. You you pick the wild slash and you're like, this card is going to be awesome if my deck turns out to not be bad. Pyrotechnics, on the other hand, at least pyrotechnics is just. You can play, you know, four red sources and the card is fantastic. Yeah, we do agree on that. Yes. <laughs> I definitely <laughs> like pyrotechnics better than Wild Slash. All right, let's move uh let's move on to some of our questions here because we've got quite a few, Patrick, and I wanna get uh plowing away on these. And as you'll see, uh some of them are broader in nature than others, and this one is from uh I don't know how to say that. I'll figure it out in a minute. But he says, I'd like to know Patrick's opinion about the evolution of magic as a game that's occur- occurred during his career as a professional magic player, <laughs> which is effectively the entire duration of the game. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I was a highly competitive tournament player before there was a pro tour. And uh, it's definitely been interesting seeing the evolution from, 
you know, like for instance, the pro tour being invented to all the different stages, you know, the sort of growth of it to what it is today. And I mean, it's, it, there's been some radical changes. I mean, the fact that there's 15 times as many people playing, you know, that's gotta times. be the biggest change, right? Just the fact that it's become just massive. Yeah. I mean, like, look at how many numbers are on people's DCI numbers. I mean, it's like, yeah. there's, but the, there's also the, the fact that we, you know, fly around the world playing this game. That's pretty wild. Um, the, something I think is, is, is kind of easy to miss how different it is, is the, uh, the makeup of the people playing on the pro tour. It used to be that the pro tour was largely populated by college age kids. Like there was a lot more, there were a lot of people in the 18 to 23, 24 range. Nowadays, the mean pro tour age is like 27 and tons of the, the best players now are, are older than that. And it used to be the sort of the, the popular wisdom was just that magic is a young man's game, you know? Right. Yeah. And that's, that's been one of the big changes for sure. I sure hope it's not the case. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that question was from VUC rules. That's what I'm going with on that one. Um, another question, similar, somewhat similar um, from Michelle. He says, he or she says, uh, Patrick, since you have, since you're known as the innovator, I was wondering what would you change in the game if you had your way? Uh, would you create uh, more fa formats, fewer formats, change draft structures? Innovate away, he says. So maybe you could just pick, you know, something that pops out to you as like that, that you've always thought the game would be better if it was changed. Marshall, you couldn't find any like open end questions. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I, I did make him narrow it down to one, <laughs> one change. And it's got to be something not currently in the works. No, nah, whatever. I mean, just uh, if it's in the works, I think that's even better because it means it's actually being changed. But yeah, yeah, yeah do that. Um, let's see. I guess if I could change one thing, because I don't know, magic is awesome and trending in a good direction. But I guess, I guess my my the first thoughts that occur to me are um, are Mitgo. I think could be uh, an improved experience if if it was more optimized. For uh, for being a video game for human beings, and yeah, I think that that Mitgo could stand to be a lot better, and I think that that would make magic the, the magic experience as a whole significantly better, and um, uh, I think that just kind of a philosoph some philosophical shifts with regards to you know what what Mitgo is supposed to be, what it's supposed to look like. I think that would be an absolutely incredible thing for magic as a whole, and then uh, I think that doing more with teams. I think that uh, the, that a that having more large scale team events would be a very very good thing for Magic because it adds a dimension. And I don't I don't think it's only at the top either. I think that having more team play outside of Grand Prix and Pro Tours um, would be a good thing because I think that the the three on three draft format is a a little bit of a lost art. Not even art, but it's like a, an experience that. I think a lot less people have now percentage wise than used to. It used to just be this common thing that everybody was doing so much of. And, um, I think that, that they're, they're getting, you know, teaching more people about the joys of three on three drafts would be, uh, an awesome thing for magic here, here. I can certainly back that up. Uh, and one thing ahead, to please. note is that even if you're not talking about specifically three on three drafts, one of the things that's the best about team tournaments is that you win or lose with your friends. And, and the, I mean, the lose part isn't fun, but it actually is key that you're all losing at the same time. So you can go commiserate you when, when you're, when you're done with the tournament. So are your, you know, presumably two of your better friends who are playing in the tournament with you and you guys get to go out and, you know, drown your sorrows or, or what have you. It, it, and when you're winning, it's even better because when you're winning, you have two people who are just as invested and care just as much and are having just as much fun. So it, team tournaments, are, I really can't say enough about them, but yeah. I'm there, actually going to stop. So <laughs> there's, there's nothing like the feeling of your teammates, like just rejoicing when you win a game, you know, like, yeah. or, or you watching and you're just at the edge of your seat. And then you're so happy when your teammate pulls it off and the three, like the, the three or however big your team is, but the, you guys as a team celebrating together, that is like, it, that is an awesome, awesome experience. Yeah, it really is. I, I also like the idea of, uh, 
letting people specialize a bit too. You know, you, you introduce these different dynamics when you have people on a team that can each do something very well and then combined they make for a fantastic team where, you know, Magic's such a broad game that it's tough, I think, for most people to be good at each different style, all these different, you know, formats, all these different things. It's pretty cool when you can, uh, you know, kind of get people together and get different configurations. I mean, that's what a lot of sports is about, right, is about, well, this guy's really good, but they don't have, you know, defensive presence and this team doesn't rebound well. And it's all about the configurations of the teams. And I think that, you know, when you have an individual, a predominantly individual thing like Magic, you lose a little bit of that. Um, Eric has two questions for you, Patrick. He says, uh, what cards uh, did he have a, des- a hand in designing, developing when he was at Wizards? And uh, since becoming a competitive Magic player, has that affected your ability to enjoy cards that weren't designed for competitive constructed play? Like, do those ones just get overlooked? Uh, or can you look at, you know, cards that maybe don't make the cut in, in standard or above, but you still enjoy them? So uh, it's funny. I actually have been designing cards for longer than I've even owned Magic cards when I first was introduced to the game, I then went on a family vacation. I didn't own any cards, and I just made up a custom set so I could play because I didn't want to wait to get back from Disney World. And I, uh, I've always designed cards. And for actually a number of years before I even went to go work at Watsi, I contributed ideas, and um, and they had you know let me know that if I ever want to, if I ever want to come out and and uh, go out you know work out there, that they had a spot for me. And I eventually took them up on it. But um, I, there's been a – I've had a long history of contributing design ideas that I, were not just during the, uh, the relatively brief period where I was physically out there. Um, I, I think some of, some of my favorites were like uh, Telling Time. Oh, yeah. Um, uh, Char is a pretty obvious one, but uh, let's see. Uh, Alpha and Omega Mirror. Um, which I often design cards that are not particularly impressive looking, mm-hmm. you know. Um, I've also been a part of some uh, some pretty horrendous mistakes and some less horrendous but still mistakes. Uh, it was it was my idea to make Disciple of the Vault cost one instead of two. Oh, geez, that one didn't work out super we, we well. We can blame you for that. <laughs> at, now, to be at the time, Arcbound Ravager cost three, and that was the deal. It was supposed to cost three, but. You know, I guess they wanted to push the uh, the fun theme decks, <laughs> and the uh, and uh, let's see, uh, oh, double side like the the Kamigawa flip cards. Mm-hmm. Now the actual Im- the actual inputs for what was necessary to flip them, uh, people ended up coming up with later. But my uh, actually my very first day at, at Wizards of the Coast, Rosewater tasked me with uh, coming up with a brand new mechanic. And the uh, the mechanic I came up with was flip cards like that, where you turn them upside down after you meet a condition. Wow, that's crazy! First day on the job. Uh, well, he gave me the assignment the first day. I had to have it. I, you know, I didn't have the mechanic till the next day. I think I uh, five minutes before work started the next day was like, uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, I just pulled out my notebook, uh, like all my my class notebooks from when I was in school that all begin with like, you know, third period math, and then. Uh, you know, an outline of the course and then every other page is filled with deck lists or <laughs> custom card ideas. Yeah, that's good. Um, what about his second question, which was, you know, do you still enjoy magic cards that aren't competitive, constructed, viable cards? I actually design, I, I, I enjoy magic uh, design more than even just playing the game. So for me personally, um, I have absolutely no problem at all enjoying cards that are not for high level play. I uh, I get a great deal of enjoyment every time I just look at a card and imagine how it could be played or when, what the scenario is or if it's – like just imagining all the different ways that people will use it. Mm-hmm. And um, I, used to, I used to make up so many crazy formats involving – you know, like cubes before it was called cube and, and custom drafts made of – you know, cards that I made up or just taking bad cards and making a special kind of cube out of them. Or just any kind of wacky formats where the rules are different in some capacity. 
Um, so I, I actually have gotten a huge amount of enjoyment out of playing with very non-competitive cards. And uh, I won't make the the, the, the joke since uh, yeah, yeah, we've mentioned yeah. Gurmag Eggler too many times already. <laughs> it just won. It just won one of the Miko tournaments. I, you know, I, I don't even necessarily think that X bad in any way because I can't evaluate it. But it is too funny to keep mentioning it. Yeah, we we uh, can't leave that one on the show. I, I am a sucker for the obvious jokes, <laughs> dude. I'm telling you, it's it's like. It's like you people are all just laughing at Tarmogoyf. Mm. Yeah, well, Dude, I mean, t- we'll people see. did laugh at Tarmogoyf, to be fair. Yes, they did. <laughs> yes, they did. Gurmag Angler is, is, is the real deal. The second coming. All right. Uh, Ryan Red Sox wants to know. He says, uh, he says, I'd like to ask, how would you advise on balancing magic with, air quotes, real life? Uh, schoolwork, non-magic, social relationships, that kind of thing. He says, I know this is obviously incredibly subjective subjective for each person but i'd love to hear what patrick has to say on the subject before uh patrick answers uh i'm curious why the why the listeners think that any of the three of us know much about quote unquote real life (laughs) (laughs) real real life or balance extremely (laughs) balanced and real life absolutely (laughs) i i really need to hear what you have to say about this patrick all right i uh so objectively speaking it seems like a very risky gamble to go all in on magic. Um, the the thing is, though, it's it's weird because I look back and it's like, well, I made a I made a bunch of decisions regarding you know abandoning so much stuff and just being solely focused on magic, and in retrospect. I'm super glad I did. <laughs> yeah. I mean, like, yeah. like, I mean, I dropped out of school. I didn't really want to work any jobs. I kind of just started traveling around with, you know, very, you know, very few pennies to my name, sleeping on floors and spending all my time thinking about magic instead of, you know, real world stuff. And the end result is that I've, I've not really had a ton of real jobs, um, but I really don't mind, and I can't really super recommend going all in to other people because I feel like I've been incredibly lucky in a lot of ways, but I absolutely would not change a thing about the choices that I made given you know how incredibly well it worked out by you know whatever you know like whether it's luck or whatever i've I've really enjoyed the way that things have played out. Now, with regards to balancing it without necessarily being all in on it, I think the key is to make sure that you're enjoying it and not uh, not put too much expectation on on yourself. Like, for instance, don't imagine that you're going to win any matches ever again. And as long as you make your decisions from the perspective of, well... Let's imagine I win zero matches for the next year. What does that look like? I'm and trying to imagine as, that. <laughs> <laughs> as long as as long as you can imagine uh, losing every match you play, um, I'm sorry. Did I, yeah, I meant lo- like as long as you imagine losing every single match and not counting on winning, it can work out because you can be like, well, I've been doing well lately. But I don't want to count on winning in the future. And you can kind of just slowly step more into it. Or you can just enjoy going to tournaments and just play at whatever level you seem to be getting at, you know, with whatever time investment you seem to be comfortable with. The big thing, though, is uh, making sure that you're enjoying it because it's very easy for people to start enjoying magic less if they try taking it too seriously for themselves. And also to make sure that you're... Like know what you're trying to accomplish because not everybody wants to try to see if the pro magic thing is going to work out for them. And for a lot of people, having school be a higher priority or relationships or or whatever, you know, whatever it is that is a high priority because, uh, I mean, I've made a, a lot of very serious sacrifices for magic. And while I don't regret them, they are not a trivial cost. And so making sure that you, uh, that you know what's important to you and what you're trying to accomplish is vital. Uh, yeah, your, your answer ahead. is so much what I would give. Like, I, I too feel very lucky to be where I am, but I also can't say, like, I had any inkling I would be here or could recommend necessarily, like, you know, kind of sacrificing the amount of time and effort 
that, you know, I ultimately did to, to get here. Not again, not that I regret any of it, but it's like if if someone's asking whether they should go like people have asked me literally, you know, should I just go all in on magic and, and be a pro magic player? And I, I can't say yes to that because I think you have to build up towards it. And I don't think that I mean, going all in on almost anything is just generally a risky move. That's why it's that, that is literally what you're doing. You're going all in. And I, I generally think that there are ways to get her to do that without without putting yourself in such a precarious situation. And I think balance is one of those ways. So, yeah, your, your answer was perfect. Yeah, I thought it's that like was being really a, good too. It's like being a – it's like uh, trying to go all in on playing in the NBA or all yeah, in right. on being a musician or going to Hollywood and being an actor or actress. It's like if you go all in and you – and it all works out and you you get there, it's so off the charts, right? Like it's just this – it's 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 like – it's incredible. It's the greatest thing. But the thing is, if you only get 90% of the way there, it's an order of magnitude lower of, of an experience. You know, it's a struggle being even just one notch down. And if you're two notches down, you, you have very little to show for it. So you better make sure that you love it and are actually like, you'd be okay with it not working out. You're just enjoying it enough that it, that the journey was worth it at all because it you know very there's very few people does it actually end up going all the way to the tippity top for but that uh, you know then again who knows i mean you know i it's one of those things where if you are it's it's like i'm so thankful that i was young and dumb enough to make the foolishly risky gambles that i did yeah it's interesting though right because I have people ask me stuff like that about doing podcasting full time too. And it's like, you know, I'm listening to both of you guys talk about this, but you guys have put an incredible amount of time and effort to get to where you are. And you're also both happen to be like great, unique uh, personalities and are also both just very smart guys. And, you know, there's a lot of things that had to be in place for you guys to get to where you're at, but you had to be very smart. You also had to work very hard. I know that those are two things that you need to have. And then for your extra stuff, you know, for the the personality type stuff that you guys have developed, you had to have a great personality too. And, you know, that's also something, that, something that you have to develop <laughs> too, right? And it's weird because when somebody asks you, hey, I want to do what you're doing, you know, on one hand, you don't want to be condescending and say, well, if you don't have the same tools that I had to work with, then you shouldn't do it. But they might not. They might just not be that good at magic or, you know, not that hard of working or determined or whatever. Or, you know, any of the things could just not be in place. But you can't really be the one to tell them that because it just sounds condescending. And so it's this weird spot because you also feel a sense of responsibility where you know the risks, like the chances of, you know, random person you meet that, uh, you know, ascends the ranks of whatever it is that they're trying to do. That's one of these sort of all in type careers are qu quite low. Like you can just look and it's like the people that try to be actors, you know, 3% of them make it another 10% of them have some type of a career in it that isn't, you know, what they really wanted. And then the rest fail. Right. And it's like, because they're probably don't have what it took or they didn't work hard enough or whatever, but you don't want to tell somebody, yeah, go for it. Right? Well, <laughs> it's incredible bad luck. advice, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The, well, the yeah, single biggest thing is be incredibly lucky in your life and have yeah. opportunity to just work out. But I think the big thing is that part of what it takes to be a professional magic player for a lot of people is a, a such a burning passion and desire for the game that you know odds be damned percentages be damned don't it doesn't matter if you would be stopped from being a professional magic player just because it's not a good idea then you shouldn't <laughs> be a professional magic player you know because like a professional magic player is very much the sort of thing that uh, that goes hand in hand with a person who is so completely enamored with the game that, that they're willing to, you know, to not necessarily look at the math so much as, you know, just kind of jump and see <laughs> what happens. They're willing to fly to a pro tour in Europe two days before their final exam, which I may have done in the year that I got on the train. <laughs> <laughs> I, I want to note that I did would. pass the class, but <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but that's true, though. You have to take – I mean, you guys know I quit my job and stuff, and that was a good job I left and didn't have you know everything all mapped out either, but you just have to know that that's what you want to be doing. Um, Patrick uh, Dyson wants to know, when's your next album drop? Actually, 
relatively soon. Oh, look at this. Yeah. Yeah. We actually just fit, uh, Bill Bowden flew out to Denver for the uh, final recording session. I've been flying to Buffalo. We're working on a, uh, a special project that, uh, you know, it'll, it, it will be unveiled in the next couple of months. We're just doing the mixing and mastering and working on uh, some of the, uh, the finishing touches, but we just finished our final recording session um, a couple weeks ago. Holy crap. A few weeks ago. Yeah, I didn't know yeah. that. I, I, I was just excited. sort of throwing it at you for fun. I didn't know it was actually happening. That's great. Yeah, yeah. I might even be able to 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 send you guys a little snippet uh, oh, God. In, in like two weeks or something of, of one of the tracks. I'd love Super that. excited about that. <laughs> I would absolutely love that. Um, uh, it's, Pip- I, it is actually so, – I, I mean I, I – but no, I, I'll wait till we actually do our announcement. I don't want to spoil anything. All right. Well, we'll wait for more official The Gathering announcements. Follow uh, at Spruik if you want any of the info on our upcoming album. There you go. Assuming he's not buried in 15 feet of snow. <laughs> yeah, Buffalo. My goodness. Um, Pibborn wants to know. So we did a thing uh, with our previous co-host before, Luisa, uh, Brian Wong, where I had an episode where I talked to him – uh, at length, and, and I'd like to have you narrow this down to maybe one uh, example, but we, we called it his his level ups or his breakthroughs. These were things throughout his magic career where he, you know, at some point looked around and said, I've, I've now leveled up. I figured out something that I just didn't grasp this whole time, and now I finally get it, and I'm better at this now. Um, you know, do you, do you have any of those that, that stand out to you oh, uh, when you were definitely. still developing your game? Definitely. And I'm still developing my game now. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think that I, I, I've had a, a number of those experiences and they've each been like sort of a turning point in my in my life, it feels like, but certainly in my game at the very least. The most recent one of those where it was just sort of a quantum leap was um, in the uh, about a year and a half ago, uh, I sort of just a little over a year and a half ago, I kind of just had this... I, I played one game too many. Like I had played enough magic games in my life. It was like right around hour 32,000 of <laughs> – you, and that's not even an exaggeration. Your, your odometer just ticked over one too far? Yeah. Like I, I had played exactly enough magic games for where I had my fill for the rest of my life for anything besides winning. And with regards to actually playing, like it was, it was weird. It was like suddenly – Suddenly, I was so much more interested in playing Lava Spike decks and Mono Green Beatdown or a some weird Black White Mid Rangey deck or whatever. And the appeal of Control was suddenly completely gone. And I still play Control, but it's like I don't know something flipped where I just the only thing that seemed interesting anymore was maximum. The only thing that seemed interesting with regards to strategy or what deck to play was whatever I thought would actually maximize my chances of winning. And uh, and since then, my uh, constructed tournament results have been significantly better in uh, in block and standard. Still trying to to get my groove in modern, but um, after my my events after that. We're uh, like a ninth place, a first place, uh, uh, top 32, and, uh, and I've been um, in a top 50, and I've been uh, very, very happy with that sort of – that new position of not, not trying to always play control. And part of it was letting go of – like I was in this loop where I played control because I knew that I was best with control – and then I never got good with other styles of play and the sort of other decks that people play in Magic now are different than they were back in the day. And so I instead just sort of focused on playing everything that people were winning with, everything that was good and learning from each of those and getting out of my comfort zone. Like, you know, I, I, like I forced myself to play Dredge at a Pro Tour instead of uh, the Sweet Gifts deck because I didn't know for sure which one I wanted to play. And so I decided to err on the side of going against my biases and just trying to get out of my comfort zone and get experience with more styles of play. Oh, that's really cool, man. That's great. That that can be a really tough thing to do as well once you've kind of settled into your personal, you know, rut, right? It's like, oh, this is just how I roll. And uh, and that's really impressive that you're able to uh, have a kind of a big change in that area. I also remember my very first uh, big turning point, I think. I... Uh, I my very first deck I shuffled up was like 120 something cards, 
Like I knew that everybody, you know, that playing less cards, everybody said playing less cards was better because you draw your good ones more often. But I, my theory at the time as a kid was, well, you know, maybe other people just don't have as many good cards as me. <laughs> and <laughs> that's awesome. And it was, it was strange because, um, I, I, I sat there struggling for like a couple games and then I drew channel and, uh, and fireball together and one on the third turn. I like and, that combination for some reason. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. That one's a classic. And it was like this light switched inside of me that just flipped where it was, you know, it, all these other cards, they are not even close to as good as doing this. And then the next deck I built, my second deck was a 40 card deck with, uh, all channels and fireball. It, you know, we weren't even playing tournament rules, just all channels and fireballs and disintegrates and, you know, a couple birds of paradise and land or elves type of stuff. But, but you knew that so- it sounds point. like a lot of fun for your friends. <laughs> well, part of it was that I was trying to get everybody to play under tournament rules. And this is way early on, you know, this is, this is before standard was even like widely talked about as a thing. Like I don't, I mean, it, there wasn't even like type two popularly. Yeah, you know, most people just played with tournament rules or not. And a lot of the people in our area didn't want to play with tournament rules. So they're like, this isn't a tournament. Why would we play tournament rules? So I just channel fireballed them over and over and over again until they uh, agreed to play by tournament rules. Into submission, Although, geez. I, I, I do have to admit, I lost a Taiga to somebody who reverse damaged my 20-point fireball. This and was a Taiga for it. anti? Oh yeah, we played cut well, how, all how the time. Else, how else do you play? Oh god! <laughs> oh yeah, you don't I want know. to play by the by the rules. It was an, yeah, and, yeah. It was an brutal. unlimited tiger. It's just why not? I mean, this is you just play with cards. <laughs> oh man, that's brutal. Um, so I've got there's kind of two questions I think that were were similar. One was from Jackson Fire one two three, and the other one was Fall Falling Fan. And I'm going to kind of combine them. Um, he says, I was hoping Patrick could talk about losing in the finals at Worlds. He says, I followed his journey from winning the Pro Tour, which he considered only a step towards Worlds, and rising in the ranks all the way to the finals. I know this was such a huge goal for him and something he strived for so hard to achieve. What sort of impact does that have on the future of his competitive play? And he also says, and this is what Jackson Fire was also asking, is he says, as players, we all have tough losses. How did he bounce back from that? And he, can he share some advice on how to recover? from our hard losses so uh first the question of how does it feel to have lost in the finals um man i guess which time <laughs> no i guess i realized that it's this time and it's it is real hard it is it's a different experience though because the first time uh like nine years ago eight years ago i yeah i guess it was like seven or eight years ago i uh I actually had, you know, I would wake up sometimes in the middle of the night, like in that moment, I was right there. And sometimes in my sleep, I would lose again. Other times in my sleep, I would actually win and I would be so happy, but then I would wake up and it would like slowly dawn on me that that didn't really happen. And, uh, this time around, haven't, ha- haven't had any waking up in the middle of the night type of situations or whatever, but, uh, you know, I'm, it's weird. It's like I'm super happy that uh, that my that my good friend and extremely strong player uh, Shahar Shenhar would win. You know, I mean, I have a great deal of respect for him. He's a very worthy champion, and it it just there's more there's more still to come. You know, because like even if I won here, even though that's like the big thing that I'm reaching towards, it's not like afterwards I just retire and peace out. You know. And that, this, that just means, you know, you got to try again, try again. And it's, it's very hard because like, I don't know, for instance, that I'm even going to get invited to the, the world championships this year, you know, obviously have a little bit of a jump start from the points from that event, but, uh, I work over 80 hours a week. And so it's, it's really tough to, uh, to get to very many Grand Prix. Um, but I'm going to Memphis this weekend. So definitely yeah, going to do everything we're gonna I can. We're going to do great in Memphis. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. As a team. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, it's, it's, it's really tough. And kind of just try to keep remembering that if it was easy, it wouldn't mean any, it wouldn't mean as much, you know? And I remember mm-hmm. part of what gives me the inspiration is the, um, it's, it's been very different since I won the, the tournament in Atlanta. Because I think up until Atlanta, losing in the finals was always just, devastating whether it be a grand prix or a, or a pro tour or worlds 
because um, without having, you know, the biggest tournament I had ever won before that was like uh, the vi- the vintage championships or uh, Michigan State championships. And you sort of, there, it's a very different experience coming in first versus anything else. And um, after having come in first that time and seeing, you know, it really was worth it. Literally everything else, the last 20 years of my life have all been validated. The last, like every loss, every hardship, every struggle, every, every failure with school or every struggle with regards to all the opportunities I've missed with, with work or with friends or with relationships, all of the things that I've sacrificed and all of the times I've felt loss and all of the times that I fell short, winning one time, it was like, it was literally the greatest thing. I mean, it was, it, there's just nothing like it. And so I remember what that feeling is like, and I don't care if it takes me 20 more years. Uh, I, I want that again. And I want that for the world championships. Um, Chief Goyo, wants, he wants to know, uh, which pros do you consider the best limited players? Uh, is, he says, is your general approach against those players in limited different than against other pros? Uh, you know, or more generally, should, one approach, should one's approach change based on the perception of an opponent's perceived skill in a format? Like, you know, if... So first, I, I do want to know who who do you consider to be the best limited players, but also, yeah, do you play against them differently? Should people play against those type of players differently? So first, uh, to answer the question of who are the best, so I think William Jensen is the best right now. Um, beyond that, there's a number of other people that are all in a that are all in this upper echelon, you know, like uh, Owen Turtenwald and uh, Ben Stark, and um, uh, I think that. That there's a a number of people who are, uh, you know, that are that are. It, it's tough for me because I feel like, like I'm a pretty good drafter compared to most Magic players, but it's hard for me to properly rate the people who are stronger players than I am at this format, and so I don't know how to order them, and so instead I know that um, that because most of the players who I think are stronger drafters than me think William Jensen is the best of them. I, I tend to, to just kind of defer to their authority. And I also look at the math when William Jensen is drafting in drafts that are full of people that are, you know, like in our house for testing, my win rate is consistently around 40% for draft preparation. And it, 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 it can be, you know, it can be real hard, but then you go to the PT and like this PT, I three owed the, the, the pod and it's such a different experience because the pro tour drafts are nothing like the test drafts and they're nothing like when I draft for fun with, you know, the channel fireball guys or, or, or some of the other, some of the other great players where it's eight people sitting at a table that are all absolutely upper echelon. So I think that there's a, there's a lot of really good drafters and it's hard for me to sort between, you know, where does Paul Ritzel fall? Where does Yuya Watanabe fall? Where does Luis Scott Vargas fall? But, uh, uh, William Jensen's probably my number one. Now, when you play against those type of players, let's say not in the testing house, but when you're at the pro tour, or you find yourself at a GP sitting across from those type of players. Do you, do you play differently against them? Uh, I mean, do you just tend to give them, you know, the utmost in credit or is it pretty much business as usual for you? So I think at least 19 times out of 20, uh, you're better served just playing whatever you think is best. Um, I think that there, the, there's an important question of asking yourself at what level is this person at? But, um, you know, like I play against William Jensen very differently than I play against random dude at a Grand Prix. No question. But I don't play against William Jensen significantly different than I, than I play against, you know, uh, I don't want to pick a specific name, random other, uh, guy who's really good, you know? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I know what you mean. So I, cause I think that it's really easy to psych yourself out and it's a common mistake to give too much credit to your opponent because you're afraid of them and you're like, Oh, they could have anything. They could, you should play the best way you know how to play. Now that said, there is definitely a certain amount of, and you got to be real confident that you actually are, that you're right about this, but there is a certain amount. There are times where you make plays, you know, like for instance, I, 
I chump attack against William Jensen, you know, just straight up bluff. I, I, I straight up bluff uh, top level players more than lower level players, you know, or, you know, because there's certain things that, that there are times in which you know the other person is aware of enough stuff and they know that you're aware of stuff that, that they would give you credit for a very specific, very unlikely situation to be the case. You know, and you have to already know beforehand why it would make sense to the person to to play this way, but it's 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 real dangerous because you got to be real sure that you're not just psyching yourself out. Right. Um, Daniel Troja has a question for you. It says he says having listened to you think and talk about constructed formats as a whole, how would you apply the same mentality to limited, particularly for difference between sealed and draft? He he basically wants to know. You know, kind of, what do you want to be doing? What, you know, are you looking at what matches well against what? Are you looking for what's just the most outright powerful thing? Are you looking for the the blend between power and consistency or availability and power? Like, what what is your, how, how do you take, you know, that constructed mentality that, you know, you've made very public through your articles and podcasts and such uh, and apply it to limited? So I actually use uh, the sort of constructed mentality a lot more now than I used to when I used to be able to play uh, all the time. Like I used to just draft, you know, all the time. Mm -hmm. And now I do a lot of my drafting cramming before events where for two weeks before the event, I'll be in a house with people and we drafting a couple times a day. And I'll, I'll actually try drafting every different type of archetype that I can think of. You know, I'll try to force myself to branch out and draft color combinations I haven't played yet. And I'll try to get a feel for as many different styles of play while still, you know, going with the cards that I that I open. But try to get experience with each of them to see which color combinations am I having more success with? What am I having more or what do I feel more comfortable with? What kinds of cards do I like? And um, I have the benefit of being able to look at the math from like – in our house, we keep track of all the records of every color combination, every uh, of all the different cards, every different player, and try to gain more informed of opinions. Like, uh, for instance, in our house, we noticed that in this most recent draft format, that even though red was uh, one of the more, even though red was the least drafted color, it was also by far the least winningest color. And that made me – that kind of confirmed some suspicions I had with regards to where I wanted to be and how how much I thought that there would be a perception that red is better than it really is. And, uh, and that, you know – and so basically just trying different decks just like as if it was a constructed format where, you know, you want to try out different ideas that make sense to you. The same is true for limited, trying out different archetypes and getting a feel for which ones – uh, you know, which ones do you like, which ones you don't. And you generally want to be open to whatever you, you know, you want to be open to whatever is passed to you and whatever makes sense to draft. So, uh, but sometimes you have preferences based on your own results, your own play testing. Right. Um, so Revolt of the Beavers <laughs> wants to know, <laughs> how does psychological edge both with oneself and over others play out at a high level competition? How can you sharpen your psychological edge? So the I think the, the, the biggest way by far that it plays out is by by staying focused, staying uh you know, your present and uh, dealing with what matters instead of worrying about stuff that doesn't matter and instead of you know letting your focus drift all over the place, people get real hung up on little tricks or um, outthinking certain things when if you just play the the best technical magic you can and focus on improving that skill set, you know that that reaps so much better of rewards. That's funny. I mean, you, you know, you are part of the big reason that. You're one of the main people that popularized <laughs> the idea of those little tricks, you know. Now, <laughs> how many times this podcast are we going to say, do as I say, not as I do? Yeah, it's funny. No, 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 no. Now, hold on. Now, now, now I, I got Shahar with the pen trick. At the I, I love the pen trick. The pen trick is my it. favorite, not because I necessarily like the edge it gives me, but because I think it's just so, like, entertaining to have it work. Because it actually does work. Oh, yeah. I, I – 
I think that that might have been what tilted Shahar enough to forget an Eidolon trigger. Yeah, you know? he was he was bummed about that Eidolon trigger. <laughs> uh, but no, but the uh, uh, it's 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 tricky because um, you can, if you want to improve the the sort of Jedi mind tricks and stuff like that, there is stuff you can do. My recommendation is to practice at low stakes type of situations and get a feel for what's actually, you know, what is working for you and what's not. Mm -hmm. Uh, The biggest mistake I see people make though, is that when they have been utilizing mind tricks to get some success, when they move up in weight class and go to a bigger tournament than they were playing at, they find they're actually at a, they sometimes will be at a significant disadvantage because they will be relying on things that maybe worked at F and M, but a Grand Prix veteran just calls them out on it and actually is able to exploit them. And um, so my, my my recommendation is that if that is something that is attractive to you, uh, experiment with it at you know times where it isn't the uh, the, the the money is not on the line, and um, but focus on improving your technical game. And um, don't necessarily chump attack into William Jensen at your first pro tour. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. The it's so hard because it's like, yes, I can tell you what I would recommend if you know if 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 Luis Scott Vargas is talking to me about a game state, that'll be a very my answer would be very different than what it would be to most people that would be asking the question in the first place. Right. But there are times where we'll be talking, you know, where. There'll be a, a position where we even just point out, you know, you should have attacked there. You shouldn't have attacked there because, you know, and we actually sometimes don't even think of it in terms of, of tricks. We just think of it as it was right to bluff there. And here's why, you know, like the other person couldn't afford to – like it would be too ruinous and it would only make sense for you to attack there. So as long as you don't leak any information at all, it's just – it, it's just so much better of a play for them to give you the small amount of edge you get from your bluff. And that's why it was the right attack to – the right play to bluff. But um, I, I, I think that anybody who would generally be asking that question is best served by focusing on playing the best game of technical magic they can. Uh, Dendrophilus wants to know, if you could have dinner with any celebrity, dead or alive – who would it be, and what one question would you ask? Man, that's a that's a big one. <laughs> that's a that is a real real good question. I guess would it be a magic celebrity or like a movie star? So I guess if I were going to go with uh, if I were going to go with um, so there's a big it's, a, it's tough. I guess somebody that's dead is more appealing than somebody who's alive because of sort of what all goes along with it. But I feel like those could be two different questions as far as somebody who's dead i guess um jesus is probably my number one pick although i also like einstein and jfk okay and i got a soft spot for uh for leonardo da vinci Mm -hmm. but um if i were gonna go with i guess the buddha is a pretty good the Buddha is a real, real good. I, it, it'd be between Jesus and the Buddha for me. But um, for alive, I guess I would go with. It, it, it would be some. It would be between Barack Obama mm-hmm. and uh, maybe maybe Taylor Swift. Oh, nice! <laughs> That's a big range you have there. What, what's what? What question would you ask Taylor Swift? Uh, oh, so this is just a question. I, I was picturing like having dinner with, just having a conversation. Yeah, you get to have, have conversation, specific. but they just want to know, like, what you know, where would you? Because I don't have any one specific. It's more it's, just interested in the conversation because it's sort of a. I don't want to project the experience that I imagine on to what this person would have to say. Yeah, that's You know, fair. I'd be more interested in hearing whatever organically, you know, uh, whatever organically we end up talking about in the course of sharing experiences. Um, so you guess, leave open a blank space and she would fill it in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 that last one I'm going to sh- just shake off. 
Oh, God. Uh, I'm going to ask a different question so we don't have to keep doing this. Um, so one of the one of the Gravity Fish wanted to know what's the status of a print version of – Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I just realized. Oh, your I question? I blew it. The previous answer, my, my answer is same, dead or alive. God, I, I completely forgot because I don't think of this person as a person. Bill Murray. Oh, there you go. I'm glad you remembered. That would have really bugged you. Oh, my God. It would be devastating. Yeah, it would have been like, bad. <laughs> that's like – I mean, yeah, in some regards, my life's work is to eventually build a school that has more of a focus on on creativity and uh, experience and self-actualization. But from another perspective, my life's work is to meet Bill Murray. <laughs> you almost gave up the chance here too. I'm, I'm glad it came to you. Um but Gravity Fish wants to know about a print version of Next Level Deck Building 2015 edition. He says that on your podcast, on Top Level Podcast with uh, Mike Flores, you said it would be available uh, maybe even soon. Can you give us any info on that? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so it's sitting in customs as we speak, but it is printed <laughs> and uh, will be released in the next uh, few days, maybe a week. I don't know. By the sometime in February of 2015, we will finally have next level deck building in print form, and I'm super excited with uh, how it turned out. Now, I, I have your your first book, ne- Next Level Magic, which was uh, a bold attempt to cover a many different topics uh, with magic. It seems like you've drilled down a bit. Can you tell us a little bit about next level deck building for people that aren't familiar with it? Well, deck building is the uh, the subject I get asked the most. Like, it's the types of questions I get asked the most that can't be done justice in just a single sentence or a paragraph, you know. And it's a subject that's very near and dear to my heart. That is not something that you can cover in just an article. Like, you can't just write one article how to build a deck. You can, but that that barely touches. Uh, you know, that barely scrapes the surface. And this is a very exhaustive examination on deck building whether it's for uh, standard, modern, vintage, uh, commander, or casual form, anything. Because um, the, pr- the principles carry over. It, it, you know, Once you know what you're trying to accomplish, the principles carry over. And there are a lot of areas that, that I think that, that people really appreciate, like being able to build a better mana base or how to take – and sometimes it's even just as much as taking net decks and figuring out – how to f- how to pick a net deck, or how to tune one, or how to how to look at a deck and understand what it's doing, so that you can be prepared against it. So I it's, I think that it's for anybody who plays competitively or just enjoys building decks. I highly recommend next level deck building. Is that it is that is the focus. Okay, well, Patrick, um, it is time for us to let you go. Uh, but I wanted to say thank you so much uh, for taking the time to come on Limited Resources and do. Uh, do a little conversation interview piece with us. You are a fascinating guy, and it's also it's always awesome to have you on the show. Oh, it's been a pleasure. Thanks for having me. Uh, where can people find you? You know, if they want to uh, follow up with you, uh, you know, maybe social media, wherever. Where where can people find you? So uh, I'm at the P Chapin on Twitter. Uh, that's definitely the uh, the best way to reach me. Uh, I have a Facebook public figure page, Patrick Chapin the Innovator. Um, Top level podcast. And Star City Games, obviously I'm doing stuff there. Um, and uh, kind of just all over the place. If you follow Marshall and Louise, you can find me pretty easily. <laughs> I think so too. All right. Well, thanks again, man. We really do appreciate you coming on. It was fun. And uh, we'll have you back on again soon, hopefully. Awesome. Have a good um, time. That's going to do it for this week. Uh, if you guys want to find uh, – Luis on Twitter. He's at LSV. I am at Marshall underscore LR. I want to remind you that Limited Resources is, of course, brought to you by ChannelFireball.com. You can find a bunch of awesome free content and, of course, all of the uh, the magic goodies to fill out your standard deck or maybe get some draft product or whatever at ChannelFireball.com. Uh, if you want to find more discussion about what we talk about on the show and a bunch of like-minded people who are into value, who are into, you know, Figuring out the little nuts and bolts things about magic and about life in some cases, uh, you can find the uh, – we have a subreddit. This is where a lot of the questions came from as well uh, for Patrick and uh, and we use it as a way to interact with our with our audience uh, and it's, it's reddit.com slash r slash lrcast. You can also find the link along with everything else over at lrcast.com.
com. Guys, thanks for hanging out, and we'll talk to you next week. All right. I wanted to touch on this week's sign up, uh, sign off on uh, networking, actually. It's, it's a broad topic, and I would expect to be talking about it again in future episodes, maybe as even part of an actual episode. But uh, since we've got Patrick on, he's also a person who's very good at networking. I just wanted to mention, I guess, a few things that I think are important when people look at this. And uh, one of the biggest is just to have a, a really positive attitude. When, when, if you want to meet new people through Magic, whether it's to improve your tournament performance, just find people to play with, people to travel with, whatever it is. Honestly, just being friendly and being someone who people want to interact with just goes such a long way. I, I know that it may look like uh, you know all the pros know each other and it, you know that it, it, they, they have this like club. But honestly, the reason that we all know each other and the reason why people are on certain teams is just because we're friends and we hang out together. And that's they, those are just natural outgrowths of that. And you'll see that even at like a local level, you see that, you know, even if you never play in a single tournament, people tend to hang out with people that they like to hang out with. And if you approach networking from that perspective, instead of just from a, how do I achieve this goal perspective? I feel like it'll go a long way. I don't know, Patrick, if you have any thoughts on that subject. I know we've talked a lot about how positivity tends to breed positivity and good results. I could not agree more. That's, I mean, it, it's possibly worth even more than, than, extra play testing time or practice or whatever, having a positive attitude and just being uh, good people, being friendly towards people, it, it gives you so many opportunities that you would never even expect and pays much better than seeing how much you can get out of stuff and focusing on, okay, here's this thing I want. How do I get it? If you instead are just, just, fun to be around and pleasant and have good conversation and interact with people in a friendly way. First of all, you have a much better time, but second of all, people like being around you and you just sort of see things materialize in front of you and you look like you get luckier with regards to opportunity. Yeah. And, and over the course of my life, I've found that, uh, like you said, a lot of opportunities pop up when you don't expect them just by being someone people want to offer opportunities to. And, a lot of good things will happen to you if, if you, you know, just treat people well and, and are friendly. And I think uh, if, if you were to take anything away is that, you know, in general, being positive has a lot more benefits than you might think. And th there's just a lot to be gained by it at basically no cost. I mean, <laughs> it, I'm not saying you can't you can't have a bad day or be grumpy or anything, but it's so much easier to to frame it in a better way and even still feel the same emotions. But just, ha you know, kind of transmit to the world a, a more positive spin on them. So. I feel like a lot of what where we have gotten, you know, individually and collectively has to do with just that we are people that people like to talk to. And I think that's one thing that you really if you can strive for that, then I think you'll you'll get a lot more benefits than, than you might think. And not just in magic. I oh, mean, yeah, that's that, that's how applies stuff, just to life. <laughs> yeah, that's I mean, that, that's a there are very few investments you can make better than that are better than than having a positive attitude. And even when it's not fair, even when. Uh, you got a raw deal or somebody else wasn't positive towards you or, you know, some, whether somebody cuts you off, cuts in line, whether somebody, wh whatever situation may come up, even if it's not your fault and if it's not fair, keeping a positive attitude is, it's remarkably life, you know, it's game changing. And on that note, uh, hope everyone has a great day. <laughs>